Well, good morning. Um, am I on? Yep. All right. So, good morning, everyone. A beautiful day in Cache Valley. Um, I got to uh, attend the wedding of two dear friends yesterday and to celebrate. And so, to talk about God's goodness today, uh, well, I'm, I'm all for it. I'm all fired up. Yesterday was great. Uh, so, if you, uh, if you guys will uh, join with me, we're going to open up in some prayer, and we will jump into this, okay? Father God, thank you for today. Lord, thank you for the message of hope that you give to us. Thank you for your goodness, Lord, that we get to sing about, that we get to learn about, that we get to experience, Lord, on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis. Lord, we are so grateful for all of that. Lord, thank you for us getting to partake in your goodness, to be recipients of your goodness, and to be bearers of your goodness to the world around us. Lord, would you please bless this time of fellowship, this time of, of learning and hearing from God's word. Please bless that time. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So I, I think it's important where I would like to start today is I just want to remind us that this is not our deal. Okay, We are going through the fruits of the Spirit, and these fruits of the Spirit are the fruits of the Spirit, not the fruits of ourselves. It's not my spirit, or sorry, it's not my fruit, it's not your fruit, it is God's fruit and his spirit. And so what I mean by this is that the gifts are in context of a life that is already right with God. So we as believers, we exemplify the fruits of the spirit because we already have a relationship with God. We already understand the message of the gospel. We understand the message of his grace. We are saved in, through faith by grace. And it is in that context in which the, the fruits of the Spirit grow and manifest in our lives. In other words, we're saved. And I think this is important because these are observable actions in the lives of believers, in the lives of imperfect people still. And so we might still be accidentally tempted to say, look at how good I've been. Look at the good that I've done. Look at how patient I've been with people. Look at how kind I've been to people. Look how loving or generous or how in self, you know, I've maintained self-control, all these different get, uh, fruits that we've been talking about, and we'll talk about, we might be tempted to boast in them ourselves, but we don't want to do that. Because the only reason that we have them is because of him, because of Christ, because of the Spirit living inside of us. So when I am kind, it is the Holy Spirit who is making me kinder than I would have otherwise been. When I'm patient, it's because he's giving me patience and teaching it to me. And when I'm good, it is the Spirit that deserves the praise, not me. These are, again, the fruits of the Spirit, not the fruits of Troy. Now, anyone who's had a few conversations with me or hear, heard me preach or anything, uh, I know, you know, students present, you know, Gavin and whatnot might, can uh, attest to that. They've heard me talk about natural consequences. I know I've talked about natural consequences from the pulpit before. And I, that's mostly because I love these things. Uh, natural consequences aren't inherently bad things that happen to us. They're just what naturally happens after a choice is made. For instance, like a burner. You know, why do parents tell their kids, don't touch the hot stove? Well, because the natural consequence of touching a hot stove is you get burned. Same thing with a fork in the electric socket or any number of things we parents warn their kids not to do. Not because they want to punish their kids, but because, well, nature will do so itself. From another aspect, I've done this with youth a couple different times. Uh, when I ask you guys to think of something nice, if I ask you to think about puppies, if I ask you to think about, you know, baby animals and whatnot, what is the natural thing that happens to you? I might get a little dorky smile, you know, and you're like, you're happy, puppies are cute, they're, they're sweet, we want to hold them, okay? That happens whether you want it to or not, okay? You don't have to think about it, you don't make it happen. And so when we as Christians walk with the Lord, the natural consequences of walking with the Lord are we become more like him. In other words, the fruit in our lives naturally becomes that of the Spirit. The longer we walk with the Lord, the more closely we walk with the Lord. The more we see and experience God's attributes, the more we will exhibit them ourselves. Like an infant who mimics their parent. My niece is almost 10 months old, and she is mimicking everything that her parents are doing, for good or for bad. You know, she is, she's exploring the world. She's, she's finding things. She's seeing, the, seeing their dog. She's seeing outside. She's seeing thunderstorms. She's seeing everything, and she's reacting to them, and she's watching her parents to see how they react, to see how they will handle things. 
and she will continue to do that for the rest of her life, as will kids who are in this congregation this morning. You guys will watch your parents, and you will try your best to either mimic them and learn from them, or perhaps avoid doing some of the, making some of the same mistakes. But, so our fruit today is goodness, and what I want us to see is I want us to see that the, the life of a believer who more, who more, not accurately, more, uh, not religiously, who more consistently, there we go, there's a word, more consistently follows the Lord, draws close to him, spends time in, in his word, spends time praying, spends time communicating with him, is going to more naturally express these fruits that we've been talking about, and so goodness. So our opening, our opening verses are, are kind of like theme verses, as, as we read in the, uh, in the call to worship, is going to be Psalm 107, verses 1 through 3, which should be up on the board, uh, up on the projector here in just a second. Um, and so we are going to read through these together real quick because this is the declaration. This is the declaration uh, that the psalmist writes. He says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the adversary and gathered from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. These verses are going to open us up because, it, one, it makes a declaration about who, about who God is. It says, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. And then we want to say, I, we want to say this, we want to stop and say this because it says, let the redeem of the Lord say so. So can we stop for just a moment and can we just as a congregation say, God is good, amen? God is good. That is, that is what we want to say. We the redeemed say God is good because, why? Because his loving kindness is everlasting because he has done things in the world, including he's created the world. Now, this seems pretty straightforward. God is good after all, but goodness in our vocabulary is so general and so broad. Do we really understand what that is? To be honest, when I started this, this, is, this was my biggest problem was figuring out how to narrow the word good into a message because we use it in so many different ways. Oh, well, that was, that was a good message. Oh, that was a good plate of pasta. That was, you know, a good time, you know, whatever it is, that was a good book, that was a good song, that was a good movie. We use this in a lot of different ways. We even use it to describe people that we admire. They're a good person. We use it to describe God, our Lord, as good. It's such a broad term. It is applied to so many different things. And so, do we really understand it? Well, I wanted to take a look, and I wanted to see, at first, the question came to mind is like, where is this first used? Where is the word good first expressed biblically? And so the first place that that is expressed biblically is, well, in the beginning. <laughs> so in, in Genesis chapter 1, we're not going to read through all of Genesis chapter 1, but we're just going to read the, first, the few verses that are here. Um, hopefully you guys can read those up there. But Genesis 1, we're going to bounce through these. You guys probably, you know where I'm going with this already, so I'll just read through them. Uh, God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. Verse 4. Verse 10, God called the dry land earth, and the gathering of the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. 13, there was evening, and there were, oh, sorry, not, I wrote 13, didn't I? That one didn't say good. I wrote down the wrong one. My bad. 18, and to govern the day and the night, and to separate the light from the darkness, and God saw that it was good. 21, God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves, with which the water swarmed after their kind, and every winged bird after its kind, and God saw that it was good. 25, God made the beasts of the earth after their kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind, and God saw that it was good. And 31, God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. God creates, he spends the week, he creates everything that is in existence, and at the very end of it, at the end of every day, at the end of the week, he says, it is good. God declares it to be so. He refers to everything he re creates as good. Then we see not long after, he uses, he declare, he uses good in a different way. And this is Saul, uh, Genesis uh, 2, verse 9. He starts talking about a specific part of his creation. He says, Out of the ground the Lord caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden, 
and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Good and evil. To be honest, this is where I started when I started thinking about it. You know, we, I, I, I grew up in a generation that loved, that has, has the whole like Marvel experience, the whole superhero genre that took off over the last like 10, 15 years, right? And that's the dichotomy that is explored in every like young adult you know, fiction novel and all the movies and stuff that kids grow up with is this dichotomy of good versus evil. And so that was very clear in my mind when talking about goodness. We've been obsessed with it. We've been obsessed with good and evil since the beginning. Because in the end, Adam and Eve will end up choosing to discover for themselves what the difference of good and evil is. But good is everything that God does. It is everything that he does does and is, he creates and he declares it good. He even declared Adam and Eve to be good prior to their fall. Prior to their fall, Adam and Eve were declared to be good by God, but their disobedience changed that. We know the story of the fall of sin infecting everything God had created so that now nothing save God alone was good. This is the state of the world at the end of the fall. Nothing save for God alone is good. Everything was tainted by sin, by evil. In Mark chapter 10, verse 18, we see this, right? He says, uh, Jesus is approached by the rich young ruler, and and he he refers to him and says, good teacher, asking these questions, and Jesus asks him, he says, but Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. So since Adam and Eve, we still have this dichotomy of good versus evil, and now man's interpretation of good is whatever they think is good, whatever they feel is good, and whatever they do, they do what is good in their own eyes. And Jesus contradicts this statement, contradicts this this paradigm, and he says, why do you call me good? Because no one is supposed to be good except for God. No one is. Now, Jesus isn't, he's not denying that he himself is good. He's challenging. He's challenging to, to, to give an answer, like, why do you refer to me as good? Why do you think I'm good? If God alone is good, why do you think I'm good? Now, we, with hindsight, can go back, well, well you're good because you're, you're God, so you are good. But this wasn't currently public knowledge, right? This wasn't currently part of, the, part of the plan. This hadn't come out yet. And for them to declare Jesus as good was a little unnatural because people aren't naturally good. Not as a fallen people. Not as fallen people who are sinners and separated from God, who is the source of goodness. Remember, he's the one who declared that all those things in creation were good. They didn't declare that of themselves. It wasn't something inherent to them. It was something that God said at the end of the day, at the end of the week, he said, this is good. I created man, you are good. And then your disobedience changed that. Disobedience to Adam and Eve brought sin into the world, which infected everything, and now there is nothing that is not tainted by sin, save for God alone. Paul emphasizes this by quoting, in the, quoting the Psalms in his letter to the Romans. Romans chapter 3, verses 11 through 2, he says this. Is it not there? Okay, let me, let me switch over. So Romans chapter 3, ver, uh, Romans chapter 3 verses 11 through 2, uh, he says this. There is none who understands, there is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become useless. There is none who does good, there is not even one. Separated from God, man is simply not good. We don't have it in ourselves to do good. Now, this doesn't mean that we're going to be as bad as we could be, right? There's There's room that we could be worse than we are by our own standards, but it's our standards that we compare this to. Yeah, true, not, 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 not all of us are, are doing some things. Some people, uh, you know, by human standards or by human law are worse than others, but we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all pursued other things other than him. And so what I like to look at is, is John chapter 15. Hopefully that one's up there. G- Jesus says this, I am the vine, you are the branches, The one who remains in me and I in him bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. 
If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown away like a branch and dries up, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. Jesus is saying, cut from him, separated from him, separated from God who gives life, who declares goodness, separated from him, we're not good. We're not enough. We, if we are cut off from him or lack of abiding in him, the result is this lack of fruit in our lives. We cannot manifest this fruit. We cannot produce this fruit on our own. It's not my fruit. It's not your fruit. It's the fruit of the Spirit. And in this case, we're talking about goodness. So we've established God is good. He demonstrates it, and and we witness it. He demonstrates it, we witness it. We who are in Christ, connected to God, abiding in him, will exemplify goodness in our lives, to varying extents, admittedly, but we will express this. We will demonstrate it ourselves. So what is the goodness of God? What is the goodness of God that we witness, and how does that manifest in our lives? Obviously, God can do a lot of things that we are not capable of doing. So what is the goodness of God, and how does it manifest in our lives? Well, our suggested text, like I said, was was Psalm 107, uh, verses 1 through 3. So let's go ahead and read that again. Uh, Just for context, it says this. It says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the adversary and gathered from the lands, from the east and from the west, and from the north and from the south. The redeemed are calling this, the redeemed from the hand of the adversary, redeemed from sin, redeemed from the devil, redeemed from their earthly enemies. God has brought them to these to him, gathered from the lands, from east and west, from north to south. He's gathered them and brought them back to him. For he is good. And we are the redeemed because we declare it to be so. God, you are good. And your loving kindness is everlasting. Psalm 107 has a specific message to back up the claim that God is good. God saves. He delivers. He redeems. There are four scenarios that are talked about inside of Psalm 107. And and, uh, if you guys will turn with me, I don't have them up there, but um, I want us to I want us to look at it in, in, in our Bibles and say, we see this. We see the first section here is is starting in verse four. It says, They wandered in the wilderness in a desert region. They did not find a way to an inhabited city. They were hungry and thirsty. Their soul fainted within them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He delivered them out of their distresses. He led them also by the straight way to go to an inhabited city. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. For he has satisfied the thirsty soul and the hungry soul he has filled with what is good. The first scenario in Psalm 107 is that the people are wandering in the wilderness. Just, just, a, just, just a, a general group of people, they're wandering in the wilderness. They're, they're afraid. They're scared. They don't know where they're going. They don't have food. They don't have water. They don't have shelter. And, and God comes and he takes them to a place of refuge. He takes them to a place. He delivers them from the wilderness. The next one, starting in verse 10, says this, There were those who dwelt in darkness and in the shadow of death, prisoners in misery and chains, because they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. Therefore he humbled their hearts with labor. They stumbled and there was none to help. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and of shadow of death and broke their bands apart. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men, for he has shattered gates of bronze and cut bars of iron asunder. Prisoners. Prisoners, not not unfair prisoners, mind you. Those who have spurned the Most High. Those who have rejected. And they called out to God, and he does what? He sets them free. He breaks down the bronze gate. He he, he tears the iron bars asunder. He, He sets them free. The third one is is this, 17, says this, fools because of their rebellious way and because of their iniquities were afflicted. Their soul abhorred all kinds of food and they drew near to the gates of death. 
And they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He saved them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. Let them also offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of his works with joyful singing. These, these rebels, these, these people in rebellion against, they were fools. They were fools in rebellion. And God still hears their cry and, and answers their distresses. He saves them from them and he heals them. Are you guys seeing a, a pattern the psalmist is trying to get at? He made a declaration at the beginning, the Lord is good. His loving kindness endures forever. That was his initial claim. He says the redeemed will praise him and because God has gathered them from all over the place and now we've seen three different scenarios where God has rescued people out of their distresses, rescued them from the circumstances that either they have found themselves in because of things they can't control or because of situations they've put themselves in. The last one, the last one here, starting in verse 23, says, those who go down to the sea in ships, who do business on great waters, they have seen the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he spoke and raised up a stormy wind which lifted up the waves of the sea. They rose up to the heavens. They went down to the depths. Their souls melted away in their misery. They reeled and staggered like a drunken man and were at their wit's end. And they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he brought them out of their distresses. He caused the storm to be still so that the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad because they were quiet so he guided them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. Let them extol him also in the congregation of the people and praise him at the feast of the elders. I was caught in the storm. The storm, obviously, that one's not their fault. I mean, maybe they could have avoided it. Maybe they could have not sailed out. But the storms of life, those come at unexpected times, right? God, in his goodness, he... He reached down to each of them in kind to each of them and save them from their distresses. The psalm explain, explains that in each of these situations, God came to them. God came to them, and they praised him. They thanked him for his goodness towards them. They were not good themselves. They didn't do anything to deserve God's help, but God to see interceded of his own accord. He came in of his own accord to help them. As believers, we know to what extent God will go, right? We know the extent that God will go. Back, back to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 5. God says this. Romans chapter 5, verse 10. This is the extent that God will go. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. We know the extent that God will go for his goodness. To love us, to, to save us. We know that extent because while we were his enemies, Jesus dies for us. Our distresses, our, our fallenness, our our, in, our, ability, our inability to escape sin. God sends his son to rescue us, to save us. So we are witnessing these acts of goodness. These acts of goodness, this is what spurs us on. That's what spurs this church to be here. Eldon has mentioned before, like, if it wasn't for Christ, why would any of us know each other? Why would we, any of us be here? We have no reason to. Sure, a couple of you know, a couple of us here may have things in common, whether it be jobs or hobbies or or it, uh, other interests, schools, whatever. But this group collectively would never know each other if it wasn't for Christ. We are witnesses to His goodness. So, how do they manifest in our lives? This is what's the kicker. This is what I struggled with trying to prepare this message is how does that manifest in our lives? Because I want to bear this fruit of goodness. I want I want to be good. I want to express that. How do I do that? 
How do I, and how do I preach this message so that it doesn't come across as a do better kind of message? How does it come across? How do, how do I do this so it doesn't come across like the, 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 the child Christmas song where it says, you better be good for goodness sake? How do, how do, I, how do we talk about that? How do we understand God's goodness and how it manifests in our lives? And how do we want to be good without being good for goodness sake? With just wanting to get that pat on the back or to get Santa Claus's attention, or in this case, the big guys, get God's attention and get his approval. Well, I mean, we do want his approval, but the thing is, is the more we focus on trying to do what we think is good, the more we're going to end up like Adam, the more we're going to end up falling. Because my experience, my knowledge, my understanding of what good is, is flawed. I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to make mistakes. I didn't put this in, but I just, I just thought of it and whatnot. So one, I, as I was going through here, I, I remember I was reading about, um, uh, about Abram and Sarai, you know, pre-Abraham and Sarah. And a ver- verse when, it, when they were talking about this, they were talking about... Uh, you know, having Isaac, but they didn't know yet Isaac was going to be a thing. They didn't know how this was going to happen, and so they, uh, so Sarah had given Hagar to be Abraham's other wife to have a, have a child, and this will be the child of promise, and this will be how God answers the prayer. And we all know that that doesn't go very well. Um, but Sarah then becomes jealous of Hagar, and Abraham says, "Go and do what is good in your sight with her," and she treats her horribly. She treats her horribly uses her, uses her son. It's just a bad situation. But this is what was good in Sarah's sight. So we, as believers, we don't, I don't want to come up here and I don't want to encourage you to do what is good in your sight. To do what you think is best. To do what you think is good. Sometimes that's going to be correct and sometimes you're going to get it right. Other times we're not. And that could have the, the adverse effect on people. No, we want to witness. We want to talk about. We want to think about and dwell on the goodness of God and God alone and what he has done, what he is continuing to do, because it is in dwelling in those things, it is in dwelling in who he is and his goodness, that the natural consequence of doing so is going to be goodness in our own life. It's going to be goodness and the the fruit of goodness bearing in our own life, because if we're looking and thinking about who God is and what he's done, then more easily am I going to be able to do what he would do. The more easily I would be to, to love those he loves, which is everybody. Because we obviously don't possess God's ability to create, right? I can't, I can't go and just speak a word and have planets exist or stars appear. I don't have that ability. I don't, even ha- I don't have his ability to rescue I can't calm a storm on my own. I can't even, for a student who comes to my youth group, I can't even make their troubles go away. I can't heal the trauma in their life. And we can't die on a cross even if doing so would help because Jesus already did that. I believe that our goodness, our, our expression of goodness, this, this bearing of goodness as a fruit of the Spirit begins with a relationship with Christ, begins with a knowledge of who he is, and it morphs, it is, inspires us to care for others, to care for others, a desire to do what is good for them. For God... His goodness manifested in giving us life and then saving those lives through Jesus. For us, what is it? Well, we can follow the examples of the disciples. They walked with Christ, literally. They walked with him. We can follow what God did through them, right? They cared for those who were less fortunate, right? No no purer religion than to care for the widows and orphans care for those who can't care for themselves, to love them. We can be there for the people when they need need us. I can't 
like I said, I can't I can't heal my students' past trauma. I can't I can't make the problems in their in their lives go away. I can't fix issues within families. I can't do any of that. But I can listen and I can point them back to God. And I think that the biggest thing that any of us can do, the biggest thing that any of us can do for the good of those around us is to share the good news. I don't think it's, I don't think it's coincidence that the gospel translates to good news. Sharing the message of hope that enables us to even do good, to even be good, because it is in relationship with Christ in which God renews his declaration from the, from the time of creation. Through Christ, through the, through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we are good. We are good in his sight because of what Jesus did. So the best thing that we can do, the, the, incur, the most encouraging thing that I can give to any of us the, is the most encouraging thing that anyone ever gave to us. If you can think back about the first time that anyone ever shared the gospel with you, shared the good news of Christ with you, how did that make you feel? Maybe at first it annoyed you, that could be, (laughs) because it convicted you, because it challenged you. But think about when it first started to make sense. My friend friend Hannah would say, "When, when did Jesus become real to you? When did that make sense. And that's the good news. Of what Christ did on the cross, now as recipients of that good news, as bearers of that good news, you can be a harbinger of the good news. Of God's goodness into the lives of others, into the lives of your coworkers, your families, your friends, your acquaintances, whatever opportunity God gives you, you get to bring that message of hope to them. And in a variety of capacities. Draw close to him. Draw close to God. Let his goodness inspire you. Let his goodness motivate you. Let the natural consequences of a life lived with Christ be what brings goodness into the lives of those around you. Draw close to him, and you witness his goodness on a daily basis, and the Spirit will grow that fruit in your life naturally for the benefit of all, for the benefit of those sitting next to you, for the benefit of those at home, for the benefit of those you will meet years down the line. A life lived with Christ will naturally bear good fruit. Let us pray. Father God, we are so grateful, Lord, so grateful, Lord, for the goodness that you have shown us, that you've shown us since the beginning of time of creating every good thing that we get to experience, Lord, especially those of us living here in in Cache Valley, Lord, who get to see the snow on the mountains, who get to wake up and see your sun coming up over them and shine on them, Lord, to see your beauty, to see your creation, Lord. Father, you are good. You've given us that message. You've given us that hope. Lord, you have rescued us out of our distresses. You have saved us from them. Lord, and we, the redeemed, want to praise you, want to thank you, to offer up our lives as sacrifices of thanksgiving, Lord, to you, because you alone are good. And through the Holy Spirit, Lord, I pray that each of us will get to experience your goodness on a regular, daily basis, Lord, and that the fruit of the Spirit, the goodness in our own hearts, in our own lives, will continue to expand based on a life dwelt with you. And may the praise and glory and boasting all be in your name. Again, we give thanks. In Jesus' name, amen.